friend, you know, I was terrified to say anything. Um, he put a knife to my throat a couple times and told me that he would murder me and my family, or, you know, my mom, if, if I told. So I blocked it. I blocked it out. Like my mind, it was so traumatic. And then, you know, the thing that, that happened, um, yeah, they were unspeakable. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely unspeakable. Yeah. Um, so, um, Talking about the other aspect <clears throat> of my life in which uh, was another trauma was my addiction. So I'm 48 years old and I've been getting high and drunk since I was eight. So that means I've been an addict to alcohol. Eight? Hey, how did you start at eight? Yeah. How did you start? How did I start? Um, my, my brother and his friends always smoked pot and drank and stuff. So I wanted, I was, was always around my older brother and I just, the first time I got high, it was like I had arrived. That makes sense. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Um, but it quickly spiraled out of control very quickly, even at that, just like a couple times a use because. Yeah. Like what do you know at eight, you know? Well, it's. What I knew is that I was feeling very shameful and had a lot of stuff that happened to me, or was happening to me, um, mm -hmm. to where I used that. And, and, and by my environment, and what I mean by my environment, it's a learned behavior that just that one time use, or even, you know, like in my family, like my dad uh, uh, was an addict. Uh, my aunts and uncles were drug addicts and alcoholics, and you know my mom was the only one that never ever drank or did anything. She, had, I think, she had like one drink where she was drunk. But um, what was your relations with her mom? She loved you. You loved her. My mom was very abusive. Yeah, she was very abusive. My mom was like two hundred eighty pounds, five foot eight. A bowling ball. Not a bowling ball. A, a wrecking ball. <laughs> and. Um, she beat me and my oldest brother because she hated my dad. Ah, yes. Yeah. The resentment. Yeah, well, and, and here's the other aspect of it, too, because, and, and, and this is where, like, okay, so, unbeknowing to me and my brother, because we couldn't figure out why my mom was so fucked up or why she was so abusive, right? And, um, so, there's a, a mental health disorder called EAD. It's called Explosive Anger Disorder. Okay. That shit is fucking lethal. Yeah, it's from repressed emotions. So your mom it's, fucking hating your father, who gets it the next vulnerable thing? But the EAD is a chemical uh, imbalance yeah. in your brain to work, where it's a chemical imbalance where she really didn't have control. No. She didn't. But um, now, let me say this, and I'm not... I never have I ever condoned my mom's abusive behavior because it's never okay to abuse or victimize anybody ever, 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 ever. That's, nobody has the right to do that. We should be not doing that because it's not okay it's at all. So she was very loving though too. Mm -hmm. My mom was so loving, um, but there were times where I remember uh, being a little boy or I like, pissed the couch or something like that because I, had, I urinated on the couch a lot because mm -hmm. of the sexual trauma that was happening to me. Yeah. And um, the other side of my mom is that she was a single mom. She was beaten by my dad. It was, the, it's, it's always in any trauma or physical abuse, it's, it's a cycle. It's always a cycle of, of, of abuse of, or a uh, direct correlation of action from how it started, trauma, acting out trauma, and then continuing to pass it along and acting out and having her condition as an EAD, it is uncontrollable, especially without medication. My mom doesn't take any medication whatsoever. So, um... Yeah, she 
Uh, she always made sure we had the, the best night of my mom. We always had Christmas. My mom raised us kids by herself but with no help other than my, my grandma, which my grandma Hack was a saint mm-hmm. by all means. Um, I remember most of her grandmas. Yeah. Well, not necessarily, but well, usually she, the grandmas. My, my grandma's badass, bro. Yeah. She, grand, my grandmother was a freaking saint, a thousand percent. She took care of. She worked at the Central Wisconsin Center here in Wisconsin, in Madison, uh, where all the kids that get dumped off or um, are uh, turned over to the state. Mm-hmm. My grandmother was the the light worker there that cared for them and changed their diapers and loved them when their parents weren't able to. So, yeah. Um, but they good up your grandma. You know? Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I learned a lot of lessons from my grandmother. She was I miss her so much, but um, she was the one that used to bring over groceries because my dad wasn't around. And my dad was out of the house on that street, but so back to my mom. Um, she did provide. She worked. She was not educated. All the odds against her, um, you know. And uh, but she still provided. We had wonderful holidays, and she was so fun. I remember being on the bus. My mom would embarrass me, bro. I'd be embarrassed because she'd be so loving. They'll be like, Mom, stop kissing me. You know what I mean? Oh, man. Right, right. Well, like, even yeah. as a little boy, yeah. you know, you're like, Mom, stop, stop. Okay, give me a kiss. He's like, you better give me a kiss, otherwise I'm going to give you something. You know, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for real. That. That's how it was, bro. So. Um, then that led you into addiction then, huh? Somehow? The, the tr- yeah. The, the, well, yeah, between that uh, the, the, and the both, uh, the sexual molestation and the rape and stuff like that. Um, that lasted a long time. We're talking five years old till I was 14. That's nine years, bro. Well, not and, only that, but it's still you now. Well, right. Well, it, it, well yeah, to a certain degree, but that, that, that's changed. Um, but, so, I, like I said, when I arrived, I fucking arrived. Like, I was able to numb the shameful, you know, like, the traumatizing of, uns- I mean, it was unspeakable shit, bro. Um, yeah, somebody did pose their will and then to have the fear of losing your life and being helpless, yeah. So, um, I continued, so, so at eight years old, the first time I got high, <laughs> Smoked cigarettes, I drank out of all of them when I was eight years old. By the time I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I was smoking pot regularly. I was drinking a lot, and I was smoking cigarettes. I mean, like I was an adult, basically. But it was because I, the people in my family, um, everybody had their trauma and their, their clutch or whatever, and it was a learned behavior. I always heard this, um, oh, I had a rough day, so I'm going to, I'm going to, get drunk or I need to smoke, I need a couple hits of a joint or whatever dr- other drugs that they were using, you know. So, um, and it continued to get worse because you graduate, you graduate from um, one thing to another. One was a gateway drug, the first drug ever was a cigarette, then it was pot, and then it was alcohol, and then I stepped it up. Then I got into cocaine. And that's a whole different other monster. Mm-hmm. Um, where I was snorting it, uh, freebasing, and then I took it to the ultimate level of, of, in which I was an IV user. I was shooting cocaine. You know, um, yeah, that's 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 a whole nother level, man. That's that, it's that's uh, yeah. That that'll <coughs> I can think about. Just now, it's like I can taste it again. Because I, your brain does that when you're an addict. You know, I, it's not a good. It's not a good feeling. You know, because I don't like it anymore. Um. Mm. So, I continued to use cocaine because I was selling, and I got into criminal activity, and the driving force was the self-medicating. The, the underlying reason is the trauma. 
the self-medication that is the addiction, in which is a huger trauma, or it amplifies the underlying trauma. You think it's numbing it, but it's not. It's really not. You're just only putting a temporary band-aid on it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, over the years, other stuff I've uh, I've ingested probably well over a couple thousand hits of LSD throughout my life. Uh, I got into psychedelics pretty heavy, been on quite a quite a few trips. So um, anything come from that? Spiritual. It became more spiritual for me. I, I, I got a greater understanding of um, energy and um, the spiritual sense. You know, like it. it um, I was I was hanging out with people that um, used to make it for the government <laughs> back in the sixties with Sunshine Hippie Group out of California. Mm -hmm. You know, so I got introduced to them through um, a, a friend of mine. There is some sort of power to um, psychedelic. Psychedelic itself is not a drug. Like you consciously can have psychedelic experiences through meditation, from yeah, your dreams and shit like that. Yeah. And, and DMT. And yeah, diatribe mainly, which is in all of us. Right. Um, it gets a bad rap, obviously, off the street. You don't know what's on those because it comes from a fungus, ergot. Mm. And um, did you feel like it helped or hurt it, your addiction? The, the, I don't feel that the, um, the LSD or the um, psilocybin had an effect on my addiction at all, um, because there was it was different, just completely different. Um, it didn't control you in a way, did it? No, never, never, never at all. Um, trips were what they were, and whatever lessons that came out of them, you know, like and it's more of a more of an experience. Um, Where were you at this point in life? Like 16. Okay. Yeah, I remember, I remember one summer in particular of going through half an album, which is five sheets. Okay, so at this point, were you on a peak? Were you doing well? Were you doing bad? Um, I was kind of just like a lost soul, so to speak. You know, be, just because I was, li I was I was living an adult life and I was a kid and I had no sense of direction or purpose other than to seek out because ultimately, regardless of the LSD you know, and the psilocybin, right, that wasn't addictive to me. That didn't block out anything. Actually, what that did is amplify everything in my mind about the trauma and everything else. But that changed. It, it was like... It was like a pivot that in my mind where like and what the change was is because the other drugs took over mm -hmm. you know as the more I indulged in cocaine that's when the addiction really just yeah it, it, it went from down here to way up here and my brother did warn me he was like whatever you do don't ever fucking shoot coke what does my stupid ass do I learned the shots with gold okay from that time then where did Corey go from there to now? There from now. Okay, so at like, I, I'd say about 19 years old, I uh, got into some trouble, I got into a fight, and um, got, went to jail, and they put me on probation. And um, in my police report, they said that I was severely drunk and intoxicated. So my probation officer made me go through treatment. Um, and that's when I was introduced to um, a wonderful program, which is AA and NA. Um, so, for the last 30 years, I'm um, just two years shy of it being 30 years, I've been in and out of recovery rooms, um, going to AA and NA meetings. Um, I did have a lot of success um, in them, um, but I also had a lot of failure because the failure was I continued go back and relapse. Things got worse. Um, so during that time when me being in recovery, I started doing mixed martial arts and um, the, 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 
worst, one of the worst drugs that I've ever gotten into was heroin. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I got addicted to opiates was because I had a fight, I fought for a belt, got the shit beat out of me, and um, they put me on a pain contract. I went from Tylenol 3s to Ox Oxycontin 60s three times a day, four perk times. And I went out to California to do some cross training with another school, another jiu-jitsu school, um, and uh, I came back. And out in California, what does everybody do? We smoke pot. Mm -hmm. I came back to see my pain contractor, and they cut, they kicked me out of the program because I tested positive because I didn't have my bottle of pills with me. Right. So I had no idea. That's what, yeah, I didn't have any idea what dope sick was at all. Like really. Um, so um, I have a friend of mine that uh, is from Chicago and we grew up together and he'd always come pick me up and take me out to go go party, go to the motel, go get clothes. And I was really sick this one time and he's like, bro, come on, we're leaving. I'm like, no, bro, I, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I was, I was dope sick um, because they cut me off of the medication and I had ran out of my script. Um, and he's like, what, what do you mean you're sick? I'm like, man, I ain't had no medicine in a couple of days. I, just, I don't know if it's from the medicine they took me off of. And he goes, what kind of medication? And I told him what it was. It was the Oxycontin, 60s, and the Perk 10s. And uh, in which that's 180, 220 milligrams of opiates a day, which is pretty high. Um, and he goes, dope sick. I'm like, what? He's like, so he breaks up. He's like, here, man, I'm going to give you some. He goes, oh. opens a little tin foil, dumps it out, chops up a couple little tiny lines. He said, snort that. He goes, I promise you, bro, we're out of here. As soon as you get that, once that kicks in. And that was the beginning of my heroin uh, use. Um, it was cheaper. from just snorting it to IV use like that. Um, so the reason why that got so bad is I died seven times from the, the, the heroin use. Yeah, it had fentanyl in it. Um, what, what's it about heroin that people are dying left and right from it? Well, the reason why the people are dying left and right from it is because most of the time when people are using it, it either is too pure, they're using too much, or it is super laced with fentanyl, which intensifies the opiate effect in the heroin, and also they're by themselves. So, um, so if I, when I used to get high on uh, heroin, I always was with somebody. I always had somebody I was getting high with. Um, so just in case if I fell out or they fell out and I needed to get them some Narcan or something like that. Um, and I never really experienced it at first, but then once it started happening, like the, the overdoses got worse. The last time I overdosed on heroin, um, I was on a Narcan drip for three days in, in a coma. The doctor said that I was super lucky to have survived it because uh, they worked on me for over 45 minutes. I was with, without steady flow of oxygen for 45 minutes. The, the doctor said, you're a miracle. He, he, he said to me straight out, I should be brain dead. And I wasn't. I survived it. Um, I remember waking up and he's like, you ain't got another time. You know, so um, so at that time, so, so there's a list of things. was alcohol, cocaine. Opiates, cigarettes, heroin, psychedelics. Psychedelics really, you know, wasn't something that I considered I was addicted to because it wasn't like that. Um, but I can see how, for some people, it could be. Um, psychosis. Yeah, yeah they, 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 they're, well, it's not so much the psychosis, it's what they're doing is they're chasing the euphoric feeling that it gives people. More so than not, but. The, the guidance, the knowledge, right, or the experience, you. right, yeah. right, yeah. So, um, that was 
So it's been eight years now since I've touched any opiates. Fucking yeah, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Fuck I'm. Yeah. I'm so thankful. That <laughs> there is huge on your recovery. I think opiates and alcohol. Yeah. Mm. Is the main fucking fight. Well, all of it. Addiction's addiction. Yeah. If if you can throw whatever you want as far as like what the drugs are out there to use. Um, but then I graduated to a worse one, the worst of all. What's that? That was meth. Ah, I wish we got a lot of meth. Yeah, so that, that was bad. So, and then this is where it'll get me into kind of like where I'm at right now. So um, I was using meth for well over a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was ingesting it through smoking or snorting it. And then it always leads back to the needle. Yeah. It always goes back to it. Yeah, because you're wasting it otherwise. You're wasting every every bit of your dope that you, unless you use it intravenously. And it hits you different. It's a different way, different monster. Um, so, and, and I'm not, by no means am I glorifying any, any drug use um, to promote addiction or war stories or nothing because there's nothing cool about that but um so the meth use it, it attacks you differently completely different um it affects your mental health to the point to where um so i'd be up for like two weeks at a time no sleep no sleep whatsoever mm-hmm. so not only are you a lack of sleep deprivation it attacks your mental health and a lot of people are people that are out there using meth right now and if they have under like a lot of people don't know this between the ages of 18 for men and women 18 to uh, uh, 25 if you have an underlying uh, mental health history or like in your family lineage of schizophrenia and it's not surfaced yet within you mm-hmm. at that point in time in your life it could remain dormant until you use meth have a traumatic incident like a car accident or even a one time drug use of like cocaine or a stimulant or something like that mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden um, it kicks in because well, it makes the, the schizophrenia start and then you go into a psychosis. So what did meth do for you that made you keep wanting it? It's like artificial energy or what was it? What did you do? Yeah, so <laughs> it so meth is a different monster than everything, even including cocaine. Um, when you shoot that, it's like uh, you're chasing a literally a dragon. You get what's called fire uh, dragon's breath. So you jack, it hits you, you start to, and your whole chest, up through your mouth, your nose, everything turns really warm and it gets hot. And it's a rush. That's the, that's where it's the, what you're chasing is the, that rush. And that's why it's so dangerous because if you shoot too much, there's no turning back, mm-hmm. no bringing you back from it. You overdose from meth, you're done. And you're living through your overdose. Yeah, you're li- yeah, oh yeah, you're living through your overdose, absolutely. Um, so, my mental health was gone. It was absolutely gone. Um, I don't have paranoid, I'm not a paranoid schizophrenic, but um, I've been, I've had severe, so, severe psychosis where I was, um, I have anxiety disorder, and then also I'm so super, I'm hyper aware from it. Oh yeah, it right. opens. Yeah, yeah, and because sometimes drugs can, like, especially math, um, it has sometimes benefits for you, like making you hyper aware, but also that's a good thing, and it's also a curse, too, because with your continual use, it drives that, that awareness, the hyper awareness in the wrong direction, mm-hmm. to where you're delusional, and you're in a different realm, like, literally, it, it'll, you'll, think that you're not on planet Earth. <laughs> like, literally, I mean... It takes I, you off the ground a little bit. It more than does that. <laughs> I, I, I've seen I, I've seen math 
uh, turned into the most kindest, loving people into murderers. Uh, yeah, that animals in all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, to go a little bit forward now, so I was desperate to live. I my mental health was gone. My physical health was affected. Um, I I have a, a, a blockage on the left side of my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had it for a very long time, and unknowing to me, though. And it's because, it's because of my drug use. Um, so, when I was doing meth, I was putting, every time I shot up, smoked, or snorted it, I was putting my, I put myself at risk um, from dying. Because if the blockage comes in loose, it goes into your heart, you know? Mm-hmm. Right? So, um, I had friends of mine who were like, my, my buddy Dan, I, you know, I love him so much, man. Like, we grew up together, and like, his mom and dad were drug addicts, cocaine addicts. They shot and smoked and snorted and whatever, and he just had a really horrible life growing up. And I, I you know, we came into alignment when we were kids, and it was, it was like, I love him, man. Like, he's, he's sober, he's never used drugs, and, um, It really set in, like everybody else, like my kids, my mom, everybody's like, you're fucking not okay, man. You're, you're, you're gone. You know, I thought the U.S. Marshals were after me. I thought, yeah, it was, but when you're in a psychosis, it's real. Yeah. That's, that's your perception and your perception is what? Your reality. Exactly. Right. And a lot of people will kind of misconstrued, like, oh, that guy just out there, out of the box, like, no, no what he's feeling is his truth. Like, right, and, but at the same time, though, too, even during hard. that time, uh, the, the U.S. Marshals will follow you if you're a drug user, especially mm-hmm. if not, because they want to track where you're going. Um, and, like, I grew up in the hood, so I like, I, I, I can smell a cop a mile away, mm-hmm. undercover, and I, I know everything. And with that hyper awareness, I really took notice of things. You know what I mean? So it was just a... So Dan, I'd be like, man, these motherfuckers outside, they're getting ready to kick my mom's door, bro. Um, I don't know what the fuck you do. And he's like, I'll be right over. So he hangs up and he shows up. He's like, come outside. I'm like, I'm not going outside, bro. <laughs> I'm not going outside. No, fuck that. I'm scared. I'm scared, bro. He's like, he's like, dog, I got you. My buddy Dan's bigger than me. Dan's probably about 285. Mm-hmm. A little bit taller, about an inch or so, but he's a big boxes, we both trained jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts are for quite a bit of our childhood and, and uh, uh, partly our adult life. Mm-hmm. And um, we walk around and, he, and he, 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 when you're in a psychosis or you're, you're coming down or you're feeling the after effects because it has a residual effect on you for a very long time, mm-hmm. sometimes weeks at a time when you use a special meth. Um, he helped me walk through the psychosis. You have to walk to, like, I'd be looking up the door, I'm like, and literally, it's not real, but I would see cops out there, like, they're in SWAT tactical, thinking like they're gonna come in. And I'd be on the phone with him, and he'd be like, open that motherfucking door, bro, and go out. And as soon as I'd open up the door, nothing. nothing. The light would pop on, the, the sensor light in the hallway would pop in and there's nobody there. And they ain't gonna be able to. I literally would open it fast. He's like, as fast as you can. Ready, you ready? And I get it. One, two, three, boom. Open the door. <laughs> Looking outside, it's, it was horrible, man. So we're outside and we're walking around and he, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he looks at me and he, and he starts to get really emotional. And he's like, he's like, bro, I really love you a lot. And And that really hit home for me, you know, because I knew there was no judgment from him, number one, and number two, and I knew it came from a place of love, where he was like, bro, you are fucked up, and I want, you need to get help. So, um, I, you know, I, I didn't go to a psych ward or anything at that point. My, my, my use continued, um, and it, you know, it only got worse. To where you know for a while it's like you use 
and it's fun and it's great, and then it turns to as soon as you take that one hit or do that one shot, you're fucking suffering. You're yeah. you're off and running again. Where's Dan now? Dan is in Madison, man. Yeah, Matt, uh, Dan is Dan is doing exceptionally well. Um, we came from the ghetto, bro. Like we didn't have shit, bro. Like he would go to bed, um, and his mom and dad they, they have gifts. They'd have to go to bed with those gifts, bro, because otherwise they'd end up back at the store so they could go cop more dope the mm-hmm. next day. They wouldn't have the Christmas gifts anymore. Dan lives in a million dollar home now. He's very successful. And he came from nothing. Came from nothing, bro. Yeah, we both did. We came from nothing. So I got to the point, like I said, um, yeah, I remember it was bad. It was so bad, bro. Like, it was to the point where my psychosis had me in such a way that I would have ended up killing somebody Mm -hmm. or hurting somebody really, really bad because of the threat that wasn't even there. Exactly. Right. So and that's the dangerous aspect of it. And with me, if I'm provoked in my training and my mixed martial arts and stuff like that, it's really bad because it's a bad mix. It's a bad mix, yeah, because I'm automatically gonna go into survival mode and then this is then it's just natural because I I look not just to fight you, I look to end the situation and end you and Boom, that sense of control that's very huge in masculine energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, if you lose control of that animal within you, it's well, actually it's not good. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, but see, no, it, it, it's, it's not contained. Right, it's not contained. And and the thing is, with all the trauma that I've had in my life, it's naturally ingrained in me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I've even asked my trauma because I go through trauma therapy. So, but wait, let's get back to this. Oh, so I it got to a point where like I was in and out of. Um, the emergency room broke because my heart was going to explode, my mental health was gone, and I got kicked out of this one hospital, um, and then they um, gave me a cab ride, I was going to just go back to uh, uh, my sister's place, and she didn't want nothing to do with me, nobody did bro, there was nobody left, not my mom, my mom was like, you can't come, you can't come home, you know, my sister, and, you know, my kids didn't want nothing to do with me, and um, it was because I was just gone mentally and my drug use was out of control. I went to the other hospital at Mariner, and um, the doctor's like, well, you know, because there's a certain criteria that, that has to be met for them to, to uh, admit you into the psych ward. You have to either A, be homicidal, which I wasn't, or uh, B, want to kill yourself and I didn't want to kill myself but I spoke another truth that's very true that would have killed me more or less and it was the fact that I would go back out and I would self medic continue to self medicate in which I have zero filter in which that means I have no um, filter on how much I'm using or little you know so no the mass amount I keep my hands on is the most I could do. I could end up killing myself because I had no filter, I had no conscience mm-hmm. to it. I didn't care if that happened because I was getting high. So, so it's like essentially it is a, a suicidal way to Yes, work. absolutely. And so I told the doc, I'm like, if you don't fucking help me, I'm going to die, bro. I'm going to go out and self medicate. I'm going to fucking overdose and die. That's going to be on your hands. Mm-hmm. And, I, and he goes, do you really want help? And I'm like, yes. And then that's when. Um, I was admitted into the psych ward, and um, from the psych ward, they put me there. While I was in there, they signed me on uh, anti-anxiety medication. Um, <clears throat> I was kind of resistant towards the medication at first, but I was so desperate at that point in time that that was the only thing that was going to help get me back to where I was centered again, and I could calm down and. Uh, and it would alleviate the over hyper awareness that was affecting me physically and mentally in such a way. I went from there to a care unit. Um, care unit is a, it's for dual diagnosis for mental health and AODA um, until you're placed into either residential treatment, uh, inpatient, or uh, a 
mental health care service that provides mm -hmm. like a, an adult group home. I didn't fit the criteria for the, uh, the adult group home, but I fit the criteria for the mental health dual diagnosis and AODA in which the AODA, my drug use was affecting my mental health and my physical, so therefore that was the thing that we needed to attack. Mm -hmm. So, but during that time, I started watching sermons, bro, and this is, I really want to speak on this because this is the truth. I, I really had, um, I was terrified, and I had a spiritual awakening that watch, during these sermons, I was watching these sermons, I spoke so many truths, but aside of that, it like put in perspective on what I really needed to do because I was so desperate to, to wanting to get help and to, to, not, to put a stop to it that my, my hyper awareness, if that was a spiritual awakening, it was like, you have to stop, otherwise you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. You have to commit to recovery. And then I went from there to uh, a 30 day treatment, in which at that point, um, they kicked me out two weeks early. I've completed a thousand treatments before that. Boot camp, I did a uh, challenge incarceration program in uh, prison, earn release. Uh, the ERP program, uh, the cognitive uh, AODA five level B level five B, um, and then um, <clears throat> I was instead of going back to you know in recovery you have to understand as an addict people places and things that sounds fucking so cliche but it's the fucking truth mm -hmm. bro you have to change those things say that again that's where I want people places and things you have to absolutely change. So I called, you know, because my mom's a sober one out of the family, so I grabbed I wanted to go back home to my mom's and, uh, and help her out because her health isn't the greatest. But um, I ended up, just so happened, my cab got canceled. So I had, they're like, you're going to have to go back to the, go to the shelter and stay overnight, and then they'll get you a cab to leave the next day. So at that point in time, I, um, I made a conscious decision, another spiritual awakening, um, to not go back home. And I called my mom back. I'm like, Mom, I'm not coming home. I'm, I, she, That's I, powerful right there. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, and she, and she's like, is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, Mom. She's like, are you sure, babe? I'm like, Mom, I'm sober. I'm good. So I made, being homeless really sucks, but... I was motivated, the difference in that situation, even though I was released early from treatment, was it was not going to fucking change my outcome of getting my recovery in check and, and continuing my sobriety. So when I hit, uh, when I got out of treatment, I had 30 days of sobriety. Um, there's only 25 beds here in town that People, and people get turned or were getting turned away. Um, I was fortunate enough to never ever have to sleep on the streets. Just, I, but I've been homeless. I've, I've went through that mm -hmm. before. Um, and they took notice to me like right away, bro, because they were like, wow, um, you're really determined about your recovery because there's a, there, there's a, the recovery community here and where we're at right now, bro, the suit, I've never experienced the type of recovery community that's here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of love and compassion and, and empathy, not feeling sorry for somebody, but being empathetic and a lot of love and compassion along with guiding a person or showing them how to work the 12 step program, which will free you by the way. Um, and you find God in that um, or whatever higher power that you may believe in. Um, also, um, so I, I, I went to like literally, I, you know, there's 14 meetings a week that you can participate in. I went to 12 of them a week. So in the last 90 days since I've been here in town, I've hit over 170, 170 meetings. Uh, and I've also uh, stepped into a leadership role where I was chairing meetings. Oh, right. right, right, yeah, for sure, because we have to. I, I, <laughs> so where things didn't work before, and, and like where I had to really put things in perspective is I needed to address my trauma. So I go to 
a trauma therapist and I do group therapy I, um, to, to, to unpack that trauma. And then also I need to share address my AODA in which I've done all the treatment. I can teach it. I can teach the curriculum. I can absolutely teach it, but unless I work the steps myself and I really got and did what, so when you're in recovery, you go to AANAHA, CA, Sex Anonymous, uh, CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous, whatever, all of it's the same book, it's the, the big book, and you have to work the steps. You have to have a sponsor. You have to go to meetings. You have to recover. Put it in practice. You have to put it in practice. Because and people want me, I don't agree with the big book because it talks about God. And whatever higher power that may be that, that reaches out within you, um, and but here's the thing, if you diligently work the steps and get through them, it will free you. If you that big book is the solution to addiction. It literally is the cure. You know what I mean? Uh, Bill W. and all the founders that wrote that book back in the day, them dudes were on it, bro. They were at it. Because back in the day, like when people were drug addicts or alcoholics or whatever, all they did is give you sedatives to send you home. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they, was just, they, they didn't know, know how to deal with it. Oh, just give them some Valium. You know, it was two of the worst drugs you can have because you can die from them. It's alcohol and Valium, right? So it's, it's kind not, of... It's not even Valium. Like, to cure addiction, you gotta, you're never going to cure addiction. You're always going to have addiction. You just mm -hmm. got to move that addiction to purpose. You got to put it in practice. You got to put it into your consciousness. Put it as a leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the things you need to get addicted. I want to be addicted to teaching. I want to be addicted to giving. You know? Well, it's... A, and but, you're, you're right on that fucking path, bro. But it. discipline... Discipline's huge. Is, yeah. Is, hey, bro. Without discipline, we ain't shit. Yep. That, that's real. Like, that's real. I really learned that. So... So what is it, so what does it look like for me right now? So I got uh, what's today's date? Eh, that's whatever. Yeah. So every twelfth, I my celebrate my my recovery date is the twelfth of every month. Okay. So I got I'm coming up on my fifth month. So after four years of addiction, seven overdoses, and everything else, I have I can honestly be able to sit here and say to everybody that I have a hundred percent. Absolute sobriety. There, I don't smoke pot no more. I don't pop no pills. I don't do this, but I did do that. It's none of that. It's What's the last thing that you took in five months ago? Meth. 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 So meth, meth is yeah. the last one. He's the last Goliath you gotta slay, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. And and you know because when you when you recover, you slay that monster, bro. Mm -hmm. But you have to work a program. You have to go to me. It's fellowshipping, bro. It's like getting around some people. Like, we, we do this to ourselves all the time, like where we put ourselves in a position where we're around other addicts and, and that t the drug is tearing us down, so we're tearing down each other because we're enabling our, you know what I'm saying? Right. And getting each other higher and participating in that. So now we're doing something different. We're taking that and going over here and talking about our personal lives and about addiction and about the solution. The solution is the steps. You have to do that. In the first step, it says you admitted that you're addicted. You know you're addicted to, to alcohol and drugs, and your life became completely unmanageable. Um, and that's the first step because you have to admit that. Um, there was a there was a daily reflection that I read uh, while I was in treatment that really hit home for me. Right. And it puts things in perspective, especially for people that are um, just fresh in recovery, right? And, you know, or people that are um, trying to get help and, and don't really foresee the, the purpose or the reason behind it. Even if you have a grain of sand or salt, if you even have just that amount of willingness to get better and recover, it's sufficient enough for that door to open up for you. Open up that door. Right, and it's opening up a door for you to recover. <clears throat> um, my story with my life and everything is a message of hope because there's many people that um, aren't as fortunate as I am to have that opportunity to recover. 
because we do recover. But that entails a lot of work, and that's okay. I'm like, my life now is completely different. Like, if you were to talk to the Corey that was before and didn't get to this point, I wish I would have known what I know back then when I was eight years old. Now I can only imagine how much more successful I would be. Um, my life is completely different. God has put me in a position to where I can really focus and work on myself. I work a 12 step program. I meet with my sponsor. I have discipline. I have a job. I meditate. I network with, you know, with you and Brother Jeremy, who is another divine soul, you know, that, that we, I've come into alignment with and, and some very loving people in recovery that if it wasn't for them loving me, because we're all, we're all equal, bro. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're so equal because we're all addicts. That's the level playing field right there. That's it. That, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. That's where there's no judgment. And, yeah, I love recovery. I love every bit of it. Um, and not to say that life doesn't happen because life happens. I got some other stuff that's going on right yeah, now. Yeah, so what's going on right now? So, um, <laughs> a lot of loss, man, and, and, and um, uh, pending loss. So my oldest sister just passed away from uh, COVID-19 and, um, and COPD, and uh, her death crushed me. You know, I love my sister very much, mm-hmm. and uh, I was not prepared. That was a, her death was very unexpected. Um, but also, um, I have another sister of mine right now. She was just moved. <clears throat> she was just moved from um, from the ICU unit to hospice. My sister Lori has stage um, four cancer of, of a trach that was removed, and once they removed the chin, it was stage three at that point. And then once they removed the cancer from around her throat or in her trach cancer spread aggressively throughout her body and she is in a hospice care right now and could die at any time mm-hmm. yeah. but and, you're, and this is all within your five months of yeah sleep. yeah yeah and so I speak about this right and then this is where I have some peace with it right because uh, and I thank God and for this understanding um my sisters had, my, both my sisters have had a rough go in their life. You know, they're both for addicts and they've had trauma. My one, my oldest sister, she was beaten her whole life by her husband and, you know, went through a lot of trauma with that and then her addiction. And then my other sisters had been, she, my sister had been raped and a lot of sexual trauma and then also she was an addict. But with Lori, it wasn't the drugs that killed her. Or that's killing her now, it's the cigarettes mm-hmm. that, that turned into cancer, you know? Something we call legal. Right, that, right, but it's, it's just, so, and here's where, here's, here's where I have peace, right? Because it was such an unexpected death, and my sister Lori, I'm even closer to her than my, my oldest sister, in which it, it, it broke me mentally in a lot of ways. I realized that she's free. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. free, bro. She is. Um. So and, and so, how what does that look like to me? I know, like, she's up in heaven, and she's not a. She, there's no more suffering. There's no more hunger. There's no more pain. She has closure to her life, or you know, in the worst of that, and she's with all our other loved ones, and you know. Like my uh, a spiritual friend of mine said to me, he was like, he's like, bro, I bet you if you asked your sister right now if she'd come back from heaven, she'd tell you, no, no, I'm good. You guys, yeah. you know, all problems are solved. Right, all problems are solved. So yeah, and and I look, I'm hoping that my my other sister, um, that her uh, her passing is will be swift and as pain as painless as. So they're just making her comfortable now. Yeah. Because they can't. She went from, at the, at my other sister's funeral, she was 140 pounds. She is down to 86 pounds. Pale skin, no hair. 
and uh, yeah, she's yeah. And she's yeah. So it's it's all good though, because uh, she won't be suffering anymore. And I really, aside of them passing, I really feel bad for my mom. Yeah. You know, my dad died from alcohol and drugs. Uh, both of my sisters had their addiction and, and now we're in transition. One has already passed, one about to uh, pass. And my oldest brother has pancreatic cancer. So out of all my mom's kids, I'm the only one left, right? So that's another part of my motivation. I mean, I, I really, big, your recovery has to be selfish. You have to be selfish about yes. your recovery. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to. Because uh, nobody else matters in your recovery but you. Because if you don't get better, if you don't matter the most, you, you, you're going to fucking relapse and you're going to fail. Um, but I just don't want to... I feel so bad for what I put my mom through, bro. Like, just... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and, I, and, like and between me and my mom, just to let everybody know, like, I forgave my mom. I absolutely have forgiven my mom because... I didn't want something to happen to her or ha something happened to me, right? The unknown. Worst case, like one of us passed and that forgiveness not happened. Exactly. And it was such a beautiful thing because like, she was like really oblivious. Not, I think she knew, but in her mind, everything was as the way it should be, right? Um, and she didn't, she felt like she didn't abuse me or my brother, and she did. But that's okay, because I forgave my mom for that, and I love my mom. And I, I, I just like when I spoke to my mom recently, I, I let her know, I'm like, you know, mom, I love you so much, and I'm sorry for everything, and I begged her for her forgiveness. And I wish her a happy Mother's Day, and I just told her, I said, you will always be my first and last love. Because like my mom, that yeah yeah wow. like that's deep. I like that. Yeah, because regardless of whatever happened and I've done and she's done whatever, it doesn't matter. Because that's my mom, and like we only get one mom, we only get one dad, you know. And even though my dad was fucked up too, and with his addiction and everything, my dad was super loved. My dad never laid a finger on me, bro, never. But he was a military man. My dad was a a medic for the teams in Vietnam, so when he came back from Vietnam, he was all messed up and addicted, but he wasn't there, though. He wasn't there, bro. He was gone by the time I was three, so I didn't really get to know my dad until I was in my early teens, and by that time, we were getting high together. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was... Like, who is he? No. Right, right. I knew who my dad was to a certain, but, the, and, you know, so the, the conflict and resolution between both of them is I had peace within all of it, man. And, um, that's the biggest component. Yeah, because you have you have to forgive, and and in recovery we also need to forgive ourselves, man. That's the that's the hardest. Yes. Hardest. Yeah. yeah. Resentment is the number one offender to relapsing. Mm -hmm. It'll push you right back to it, you know. Damn, Corey, you got a hell of a head on your shoulders. So where's where's Corey in the future? Corey in the future is recovery. <laughs> He's going to continue to get... So, um, I, inspire, I am inspired to be a recovery coach. I want to uh, go through a certification for a recovery coach program. Um, and also, I want to become a pure mental health AODA specialist. Uh, both of them are certifications. I had the experience, as my own personal experience with addiction and stuff like that, and I, I understand the criteria and the the, the, the the knowledge of the information to help people with addiction. Um, there's a lot of people suffering, bro. A lot, of, including me. I and I've suffered a lot, you know. But I just came to a point where I was desperate. And where I always ask my grandma before she passed, she used to like, you gotta know what God's calling is for you. And I'm like, Grandma, what did you do? Call you on the phone? She's like, No, boy, <laughs> that's not it. That's 
and what your calling is, if you, she like you will know it. So my calling in life, and I know what that is, is to um, be a recovery coach and a peer mental health specialist to help those that are suffering. Um, and you're inspired to inspire. Yeah, absolutely. I what I have, I have to give back. I have to give it back to other people that are suffering. And um, so um, I, I will probably work at some facility or for an organization or, um, you know, I have other idea, a way to give back that I think is going to be pretty profound. Um, What's that? I want to develop a podcast. Yeah, and the podcast is going to be called uh, Boots on the Ground Recovery. Um, and it's going to cover a lot of different things. Um, the, the Boots on the Ground Recovery is going to represent information that is going to be given out to people that are suffering from mental health, from addiction, and also help them heal any past trauma and uh, networking together and bringing people like yourself, Brother Jerry, <laughs> Uh, other recovery coaches, people that have uh, kind of lived that life and that, that trauma. So as a mixed martial artist, I know this, and you have been in you know, your military career, you know we have to be well-rounded. Mm -hmm. You can't just be semi-okay at one thing. You got to be is that all the way around. So what Brutes Underground Recovery is going to pre uh, present is a 12-step program, um, sponsorship is also going to present discipline, uh, spiritual, physical, um, meditation is going to be the big thing. Meditation oh. is so critical, bro. People always forget about it. it yeah. You have to. Yeah, absolutely. And I know this is kind of off topic here. I'm just kind of adding my little woo to it. Sure. Uh, add dream journals. Yeah. Oh, Wake well, up, write your dreams down. Well, yeah, but... So, in, in the touch in with that, with that, I do a lot of journaling because I know what is one of the, one of the things that we do as humans, man, is we hold on to the resentment or the regret in our heart and mind, right? And it poisons you, bro, from the inside out. So, one of the best ways to release that is writing it out, writing it out. You got to journal about it, journal about it, go outside and take your socks and shoes off and go hug a tree and walk into the water and ground yourself out. Return to your breath. It's all the things that, um, but more importantly, uh, the Boots on the Ground Recovery is gonna um, also sponsor, my hopes is to sponsor people to go into treatment and pay for the treatment and also pay for their trauma care or whatever. Uh, or present educational information and access to people that are super tuned in and about building people up and healing. That is the ultimate goal of that podcast. Awesome. Yeah. You keep that mission going, and I will be in support of and everyone who's watching. Let's make sure we make this happen for them because we need more good people out there. Right. And we need more messages out there. We need human experiences. Uh, my experience can tell you something. He definitely taught me a lot today just within this hour. Um, and hopefully it correlated with you guys as well. And we just got to keep pushing that positive message. Absolutely. And there is hope. Like, look at him. He, he, look at all that shit he went through. And he's here right now, yeah. despite of everything, bringing you into his story, bringing you into his life. You know? Yeah, I, I, share, I share my life with people. I share what I've experienced in my life because um, there's people that we're all the same. There's somebody out there that's listening to us right now that has had sexual trauma that happened to them or been raped or molested and has kept that secret and has put them in the position that they're in where they're suffering. There's people that uh, are addicts out there that are closet addicts or people that mm -hmm. use and people don't know about and this is for you. This is the we do recover. We have to recover. Um, and like 
that podcast. Um, I have some fine tuning things, and I think we can talk about it a little bit more um, and when things are going to come to fruition. But once it happens, so stay tuned because it's going to be epic. It's going to be epic. It's going to be loving. It's going to be compassionate. It's going to be about recovery. So, I love that. Yeah. So, where can people uh, reach you now if they want to contact you, talk to you, or maybe even help you on your journey? Um, I. As of right now, um, people can contact me on my Facebook. Just your Facebook? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's C O R Y H A A K. And uh, they can friend me or send me a message request. Um, I'm kind of leery about, you know, because Facebook can be kind of sketchy. But uh, yeah, but the podcast, I will be announcing on my Facebook when the podcast will start and also through your. Yep. Um, yeah. Gladly, we'll show you through Arms Hub and Epic Sports. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I'm here for you, man. Absolutely, appreciate I it. appreciate you for giving me the time and yeah. your story and everyone else. Um, stay tuned. I'm gonna. If you want to be on this, you have a story to tell. Who are you? Let's uh, get it out and spread more human experiences. And this is real school. This is school life right here. All right. I right, love you guys. Love you, Corey. Love you. Thank you. Appreciate all right. You, bro. Thank you so much.